Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode three of Diaspora Chronicles. My name is Malonga Muchalemba, and I am the founder of Angolo.com, a pan-African website whose main objective is to keep Africans connected and engaged. On today's show, I will be interviewing the author of Vagabond, Wandering Through Africa on Faith. It tells the story of a young South African woman's journey through Africa that lasted five years. So I'm delighted to invite on my show, Lerato. Lerato, just give me a sec. Let me bring you on. Welcome. Hi. Hi. So good to see you again. Good to see you too. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program. I'm really excited to hear your story and to share your story with everyone watching. Fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me over. I'm quite excited. You know, I love, love African Pan-Africanism and platforms for us by us. I'm quite excited to be here. Oh, that's great. Well, let's get started because I really wanted people to get a sense of who you are, um, you know, your background, but also your personality, mm -hmm. because I think that informs your story. Um, <laughs> I'm really just a girl who comes from Pretoria in South Africa and I've just always wanted to see the world in particular Africa I've always I think whenever I think of myself and my life I think of, of it in terms of influences and they've always tend to be African and pan-African and it has always had to do with the written word in particular literature but other manifestations of storytelling using the written word and I just wanted to find a way I guess to combine everything that I love so the love of Africa, the love of storytelling, the need to have my point of view told. I remember when we were planning to get into Jen school, you had to, to write why you wanted to, to tell stories. And I was like, I want to tell the voices of black women. I want, you know, there to be the voice that I write. And I think in a sense, that's, that's always my voice because I'm thinking about myself and I'm the women that I know and the women in my life and the women I grew up around and I think about but these women are sassy, they're spanky, they're free, they have booty calls, they drink, they swear, oh they don't swear, you know, they go, they fast, or they don't, but just layered and dynamic and interesting. And I just wanted that to come through because in a sense, to get a sense of who I am as an individual, but to get a sense of the people and influences in my life. But also I'm hoping that you get the, the, the richness of the continent. You know, you get to see the humor, the heartbreaks, you get to see the adventure, the fantasy, you see the mundane moments that mean nothing. Like, I mean, gosh, cleaning an apartment, yuck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you really just get to see a sense of the continent as you know it in terms of it being your home as an African and if you live, lived on the continent and even if you've never lived on the continent you see a sense of home and perhaps it can be home in how you also have certain rituals in your life it can be home in how you are uh, you go on a re regular quest for identity it could be home because you are also going on internal journeys and as you see them happening in the book you're like ah yes i've definitely been on this internal journey of trying to discover who i am rediscover my magic find my voice and so on Oh, wow. So actually, you, your intro is perfect because it takes us into, you know, my next question, which is how did you decide to quit your, your job to travel to Africa? So when I've been telling people you're coming on my show, I've been saying we have an equivalent of Eat, Pray, Love, which was, you know, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert embarked on this journey. But <laughs> her trigger was she got divorced. So what's your story? Like what inspired you to to leave your job? So please tell people your story, actually, because it was really fascinating. You quit your job and you decided to travel to Africa. Yes, I'm um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit itchy and I'm coughing a bit, so please bear with me. When, when I was, so when I was 13, I read, or 13, I read things, when I was eight, we had a lesson about ancient Egypt in class. And I remember thinking, wow, the world is so, so rich and so beautiful that it could be that old and still exist within my contemporary context. And furthermore, it has artifacts and heritage and all these other things things that are incredible and speak to that ancient time. I want to know this world. That was my very first influence. My second influence was I've always loved reading and there's always a book buried in, I'm always buried in a book. 
But when I was a kid, I, I wasn't particularly thrilled because I think books that were aimed at kids sometimes can be a little bit dumb. Um, I don't know. No, not dumb. They can be a little bit too over-motivating. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, like after you gobble those up, you want to read and then there's no, it doesn't feel like there's the perfect literature mm -hmm. for a young curious mind. But anyway, I read things fell apart at school and I, I thought it was brilliant because I was 13. So I didn't know a lot about anything, but I found it very engaging. I found it exciting. It had interesting concepts around identity, religion, feminism, or rather why I needed feminism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of, and that got me into African literature. So after I read things fell apart, I just gobbled it all up. African literature, there's African literature that, because it introduced me to, again, to an older time, right? Mm -hmm. But also I used to wonder, wow, you know, simple things like, what does Jollof Rice taste like <laughs> when I read books? <laughs> How do they pronounce the name of the city? Is it Lagos or Lagos? You know, things like that. And and I remember thinking, well, it would be really, really great to travel the continent. Mm -hmm. In 2006, we had a work trip to Accra. I was working as an entertainment journalist at City Press at the time. We had a trip to Accra for four days. It was a media trip. It was fabulous. We were hosted. We got to see a five-star hotel. We got to see the nice side of Accra, right? And I mentioned mm -hmm. the niceness because there's a difference between backpacking and living on a budget <laughs> and being hosted <laughs> by a PR company as part of media. And so Accra is fabulous. I enjoy it, but I also enjoy the things that you really don't travel for. You know, um, for instance, I noticed how everyone would always smile at me and laugh so, so heartily. It was as if they knew me. It was as if they were happy to see see me even on traffic even when I was just driving past in a split second I noticed the sense of humor I mean you know sometimes there was a, a freedom to it that should have offended me but didn't because I wore a mini skirt we went to a club right and when we go to a club there was a stripper's pole and I mean there's music it's fun I dance so then these guys start propositioning me and I keep thinking Jesus why are these people coming to me with so much confidence who the hell do they think they are honey girls Mm -mm. you know <laughs> I don't think so but everyone comes to me like they have a chance so finally this guy comes to me and I ask him like why is everyone propositioning me like you think you have a chance that's like a little bit quirky but like quite amazing as well yes okay why and he says oh oh you're not a prostitute <laughs> oh my god <laughs> because of the mini skirt I was dancing and he says there's some people on the show who are not African, so they might not understand that when you when you wear like we're very conservative by nature. So if you're dressed up in a certain way, people might misunderstand. Though people are becoming more liberal now, so that's yeah. a real thing, you know. So so, but that was I laughed it off, right? Anywhere else, I probably would have punched him, but I laughed it off because. You know, I felt so easy. There was just a way of being in Accra, the way my blackness felt, the way my black skin just, it fit me like a glove. You know, I come from South Africa and I travel, definitely travel and experience the world as a black South African woman primarily. And this is very important because I live in a racialized society. I live in a country where I'm still, where they're still grappling with seeing me fully, equally, in very many specific ways, economic ways, cultural ways, social ways, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So that is really my experience. So I remember in Accra, we were at a, at a supermarket getting drink at water. And I remember thinking, there's something very different here. There's something very different here. And it later occurred to me that everyone was black. The owner, the manager, the staff, the, everyone was black. And I was in a black area. And in South Africa, when you're in a black area, when you leave a supermarket, they want to search your bags. They want to look at your receipt. And so I always tense up and I get ready to fight because that's not happening with me, right? But in Accra, that didn't happen because I also kept on thinking there was something that I was expecting that my body was ready for and it never happened. What was it? And later I realized, oh, that's what happened. And on my fourth day, and which was the last day in Accra, I said to myself, you know, if I say a Woolworths, I'm going to move to Accra. A Woolworths is a supermarket. They sell clothes, okay. they sell food, they sell everything. And I really love it because it's convenient. It's where I go to if I quickly need 
a dress because I, I was too lazy to do my laundry and I, don't, I now need to go to a picnic if I need. I'm lazy and my friend is coming over to visit because I promised to cook for them. That's where I quickly buy something, you know, and warm it up and pretend like it's mine. <laughs> so, so, so it just represented comfort. You know, I didn't, I didn't expect to see the store physically. I was just thinking in terms of comfort and ease of living in the city. You know, um, less than 30 minutes later, lo and behold, there's a Woolworths. And I'm a whimsical person, so of course it was a sign. I had to move to, to Accra. We came back to South Africa, spent 2007 trying to find a job in Accra that wasn't working out. Then I, th I said to myself, well, I might as well, instead of moving to just Accra, start living my dream of traveling around the continent. And I just work as a freelance journalist. And literally, that's how it started from four days in Accra. And... Um, I don't know why it's been compared to it. Pray love. There is definitely no me. because I, I'm not. I'm not influenced by crisis. I do not make decisions from a space of of crisis. I do not make the wrong decisions for my life to begin with. So you know, I wasn't on my knees begging life to work out for me. I was actually on a high, um, asking life, let's take it higher. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And I, I described you as a free spirit because you're very comfortable in yourself and you know what you want. So I guess the next question, um, and people will be curious to know, where did you actually go? And I know you started traveling in, in 2008. So did you just want to take us through like, where you went to, what you did when you were there, and how long you spent in some of these countries? I started in Accra. No, no, not in Accra, in Dakar. In Senegal. Um, okay, okay, better. Yeah. I, I started in Dakar in Senegal. I was there for like three weeks, three and a half weeks. Then I went to Mali, then Burkina Faso, Ghana, and Ivory Coast, right? So um it was two and a half weeks or however much time in, in, in Senegal. Then I spent about like seven, eight, nine days in Mali. Um, I didn't stay long when I was traveling the first time around. And I remember when I was in, in, in Accra, I, had, I think I'd been traveling for four or five months. No, I think it was close to three months. Mm -hmm. And feeling so depleted, I was tired. I felt like I wasn't having I was having fun, but it didn't feel organic. So it felt like my trips were me just going there and seeing touristic sites and not really experiencing what I wanted to begin with. I'm a very emotional person and I don't grapple with being, my sister calls me an ocean of, ocean of emotion. And I don't like, I don't struggle with being a very highly emotional person and I'm led by my feelings, you know? So I wanted to feel the journeys you know i wasn't feeling them they were just not hitting a certain emotional and spiritual spot for me so you did and i was not just to recap you did three months and you realized that actually you weren't getting that yeah. experience that you wanted so you hit the reset yeah. button yeah because yeah so because i mean i was seeing things and i was experiencing things so on the surface everything was working out perfectly but as far as external journeys go, I wasn't going on that external journey and I wanted them. So um, I was in a crowd and my friend said to me, you know what, just like also chill out, man. You know, ever since you got here, you've been like so intense. You're not, you're not, you're not relaxing either. You're not having fun. You know, like you're not, I'm not hearing escapades of how you found a reggae club because at the time I loved party yeah you know, so i'm not hearing stories of how you find a reggae club and started a fling and how you're on a first name basis with a barman who knew what to drink when you just like walk through the door and stuff right so i went to this place called kokrobite in in ghana and that was nice because it allowed me to settle down um and just really settle into my journeys and just enjoy them and just enjoy being in a different space of mind being a different space geographically culturally mm -hmm. traditionally and and then truly truly enjoy the magic of what was happening you know the magic of of west africa is that there are coastal villages mm -hmm. so you can find what would be prime inaccessible property in south africa as accessible as ever so i really enjoyed that <laughs> laid backness of west africa so i got into that and then i went to to 
Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm. Against this backdrop is the, the fact that I'm traveling broke. I'm working as a freelance journalist, but I'm never paid on time. So I'm always running out of money and it's really, really frustrating. So I run out of money again in Ivory Coast. Once again, I'm sending very heated emails. What the hell is my money? I worked. How dare you extracting a black woman's labor and not compensating? <laughs> true story. True, true story. You know, I wasn't being an angry black woman. I was being it was being a true story. So, okay. so then I think, geez, I just need to go home, you know, and chill out for a while. But then also, I feel like the thing that I came here for still hasn't happened. What am I going to do? I'm at the crossroads. I listened to my favorite album of all time called Afriki by Habib Kwate. Mm -hmm. And as I'm listening to it, you know, I love what I love most about, about that album um, is that it creates a world in me you know when i listen to it my mind my body my spirit my intellect everything everything um gets involved even places that i don't know so when i listen to to that album i i, I see i just imagine myself discovering new things just on a long road trip bare almost desert like you know and i just think wow there's so much that i need to get i want to see this so i thought to myself okay fine i'm starting over i'm going to mali because habib was going to perform at the festival of the desert mm -hmm. and when i went to apply for and my when visa, was i was planning when in the year was this it was in 2008 so still there the first year of traveling okay um this is maybe month June, okay. July, August, September, October, November, December. So almost six months in, in Ivory Coast. And when I was applying for my visa, I wanted a two month visa. The lady said to me, um, I give you four months on the house, but you must promise to stay the whole six months. Again, I'm a very whimsical person. So I'm like, sure, I'll stay six months. I'm not in a hurry. Just and I stay with months. you uh, on the story. So you were traveling to places and you were renting apartments, not staying in hotels. Not everywhere. Okay. I initially, I stayed in hotels, but then around three, around four months in, I just like wanted, I was just like, something has to give, you know, I need to be, I, I, I don't travel to meet other travelers. I, I travel to immerse myself in local life and mm -hmm. to, to almost have my life reimagined if I were born in Zambia or in okay. Ethiopia and all, and all those places. So it's very important for me to stay in very local places with communities, with people and create a life for myself there, right? So like, for instance, in, 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 in Stone Town, um, I ended up having a guy where I buy all my cabbage from and someone that I buy my tuna from and someone that, I, you know, something that rich, that everyday life, that ultimately becomes the memories that last forever for me. Mm -hmm. So in Abidjan, I decided to go to, to Mali. This lady give, gives me six months and and I stay in Mali for six months. Um, in, in Timbuktu, I was supposed to go there for just a week, but I found out that Tabum Beki and some other South African VIPs are going to be in town in a few weeks. So what's Timbuktu like? It was Everyone, nice. So I stay. What is Timbuktu like? Just Timbuktu. You want to give people um, a chance to come with you on the journey. So if there's anything specific, like when we spoke, you told me about you know Mali and walking down the river and how people just play music. Yeah. I really want to be able to um, for people to walk with you on your journey. So um, just yeah, just let us know what some of the highlights are and what life is like in these places. I think. Um, with Timbuktu, the highlight is is this, this it's surreal, you know. You it's so unbelievable. You finally there. You maybe maybe you've seen the pictures, you've heard about it, you wanted to go, you've seen some documentaries or whatever. But when you're finally there and these things um are within distance, you know, now I'm walking around these these streets of Timbuktu, it's it's in the desert, so my feet were always sinking in the sand and the sand everywhere, sending the food, sending the bread because it's but why do people go there? What's in Timbuktu now? You you go there because I mean I I guess you go there to 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 explore, but the reason um a lot of people would have gone to Timbuktu is because of the manuscripts of, of Timbuktu and the history and heritage of Timbuktu is a very old 
place that's like been around for hundreds and thousands of years mm -hmm. and also yes mm -hmm. D Duncan you're right very music centric nation so also when you go to Timbuktu you get to experience the desert blues right so I like what Duncan says about what D Duncan says about music my list music catalog is so rich and it's not central centralized in one place. So if you go initially because you love, say, Salif Keta and Musangare and Habib Kwate, and you, you tell yourself, I'll just go to Bamako and experience them in Bamako. Once you get to Bamako, you realize that, oh my gosh, there's such an even richer music traditions and, and, and identity. Let me then go to this particular region. Let me go to this particular place so that you keep experiencing it because it really, really is an intense experience. I think Malian music is probably the most the single most intense thing I've experienced is the, oh, wow. the, to experience the scale and scope of Malian music and experience the culture in Mali itself, right? Um, that was great. So for instance, one of the things that is so, so precious is that in, I used to read, um, I, I read in a book, this guy who was also a friend of mine, he, he went to Bamako and he said, you know, um, he, there would be people in handheld radios listening, very small handheld radios, listening to Griot music, listening mm -hmm. to Wasolo music. And he was writing probably about 10 or 15 years before I traveled to Bamako. Mm -hmm. And then I get to Bamako, you know, and it's exactly like that. I walk down the riverside and there's someone with a handheld radio listening to grow music. There's someone in a grand pool walking like royalty, just filling out the streets with their presence, with their humility, with their character. So it really is like that, you know, right? So wow. I think it explains, it also explains why I ended up traveling traveling for five years mm -hmm. when I was supposed to be gone for three months because also I realized the the beauty in staying right I want I had time so I wanted to stay I wanted to know to know people so that they could and I wanted people to also know me right That's I wanted great. to feel being a print mark I was leaving a, a mark of identity so I'll give you an example when I say I wanted people to know me um when I lived in in Bamako um, I didn't speak French. Mm -hmm. I didn't speak French. And one day after many months in Bamako and I had learned enough French and I had fit in, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I understood the nuances of life there. And one day I'm trying to get into a cab and this guy is charging me something ridiculous and I refused. And I negotiated him all down in, in, in French and he said, oh my God, now you can speak French. We'll never ever get to make an extra 20 bucks out of you, you know? Oh, and then oh someone, one of my housemates said to me, oh my gosh, you're a chatterbox. And I was like, yeah, hey, finally, you know, <laughs> because these things couldn't happen when I was only conversing in English, when I couldn't speak French, they were limited. So now I, because I had stayed, people also got to know me. And um, even when I didn't stay, Staying in Mali for that long also taught me that even when I didn't stay long, I could create certain memories. When I was in a place in Mozambique called Kilimani, I was just there for just over like a day and a half, right? But um, I met a guy on my way to the beach to go swimming at Zalala Beach. I met a guy called Mr. Samson and he said to me, hey, listen, why go swim when you can enjoy um, the fish market, right? The beach is it's great, but let's all go to the fish market. So we go to the fish market, to the fish merchant, and these boats are coming in from the ocean. They're bringing in lots and lots of fish. And then some of it is for sale for bulk buyers. Mm -hmm. Other, you just go to cook. And then it's, it's really top grade seafood and it's so cheap in Mozambique. So I was just like, well, I don't care that I'm staying at a, at a, at a hostel. I'm going to buy crayfish or I think it was lobster. I bought lobster, I bought calamari, I bought prawns and something else. And I, and I asked Mr. Samson to write me a note asking his friend to let me use his kitchen to cook. And so I go to his friend's house and the friend says, the friend isn't home, but the wife is home and the wife say, tells the son to take me to the restaurant, tell the manager to allow me to cook at the restaurant. So I get to the restaurant, everyone says, okay, you want to cook? How does that work? And I'm like, no, no, no. I want us to cook together. So I cook with this lady called Angelina and she doesn't speak English. I don't speak Portuguese, but the moment was so beautiful. We just cooked. And then afterwards, we all ate um, about five, six of us. We all just ate, right? So now, um, even though we might not know each other, that much because we didn't have language in common and I didn't stay long enough to 
for us to learn each other and discover each other. I'm sure they also have the story about that crazy chick who walked in here with seafood <laughs> and a note wanting, <laughs> wanting to cook. That is wild. It would never happen anywhere else. You, you, but what you said actually captures the essence of traveling in Africa because people are very friendly. People will take mm. you in um, even if they don't know you. And even if you don't speak the language, somehow you communicate. And I think that's probably the key message I would take from what you said. But I also wanted to just run through your your favorite places. So we had talked about what some of your favorite places were. And I know Mali is on that list. So where else? Mali. Yeah. Um, Egypt. I loved Egypt. Egypt was like a fantasy. I was living my childhood dream. The pyramids, going to the Cairo Museum, and then going to Luxor and getting on a... A hot air balloon in the morning and so the valley, yeah, the valley of kings and queens, and just soaring over these ancient historic um tombs and 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 town and um going to Dahab still in Egypt on the on the coast and just getting there and discovering this sweet little spot of a destination that's very hippie, um, that's very relaxed, very bohemian. And it turns out that when you're there, you can just hike the Mount Sinai, wow. you know. So it felt very nice. Just like, oh, look at me. No big deal. Just doing like Moses when he was getting the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. You know, I really, I love that about Egypt. You know what I mean? I love, it just feels like, it really feels like a storybook. Whether your storybook is um, archaeological text or religious text or whatever, right? In my case, it's just a culmination of all of them because oh, I love wow. Eastern heritage so much. So it, it just feels like, Oh, wow, this is incredible. Where am I? What date? What time? What era? What universe? So I really love that. And then there's a place in Ethiopia called Hara. Mm -hmm. It's the fourth holiest city in the Muslim religion. You know, Islam is very conservative, very strict. But in Hara, the right time to drink alcohol is when you damn well feel like it. There's a beer um, in Ethiopia that's called Hara. It's very strong. It's brewed in Hara because Hara has a brewery at around 12 midday half the town shuts down because it's time to chew cut cut is a mild narcotic leaf that's bitter that's very popular around the horn of africa and another thing that i loved about hara was that oh, wait, hang on let's go back you people chew what what does it do for cut. you it's, it's a leaf it's a bitter leaf called it's a bitter leaf that's a mild narcotic you chew it with peanuts or gum and you don't swallow it though but you just suck out the juices and um eventually like hours later it's supposed to make you feel high <laughs> oh my god <laughs> okay that explains the connection with jamaica <laughs> okay yeah and and in hara so it's cool like that you know is this uh islamic city holy but vice and um, i found ethiopia very oppressive because it didn't have i felt that it lacked a lot of room for individual identity and everything felt like so similar and everyone sounded the same after the same ate the same food so it was constantly frust a frustration for me but hara was great because okay. i felt like there's a lot of room for just individual expression and um the nicest thing about hara is that there's a there's a legend around the town, right? It mm -hmm. says that a long, long time ago there was a drought and it forced the hyenas that live on the highlands of the of Ethiopia in, in the Inhara. It forced them to come into the town to look for food and it started killing people and eating people. They started eating people. So the Harari people and the king of hyenas met and made a pact. If the townspeople start feeding the hyenas, the hyenas must leave them alone and not kill them. Therefore, as a result, even up to today, every day, just after sunset, towards the, the beginning of the evening, on the outskirts of Hara, the hyena men of the town meet to feed the hyenas <laughs> and oh. they buy scraps of food for them at the butcheries, bones, things like that. And they feed them. But not only do they feed them, right? There, you can feed a hyena from your mouth to theirs. They, you take oh, really? it <laughs> Yes. You put, you take a twig, you wrap some bits of animal flesh, I guess, that you're feeding the hyena. You take the, the other bit of the flesh and put it of the twig, put it in your mouth. The, the bit that has the stick goes towards the hyena and the hyena just comes within 
close range to you, takes its 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 food and goes gets on with it. Actually, I've got the picture now because it was taken ages ago. Yeah. So, um, you so, want to just explain? So, people are feeding the hyena in here. Yes. Yeah, so that's me. Oh, and, that's you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I'm getting I'm getting ready to feed a hyena from my mouth. So as you can see, the hyenas will be circling. There's, are, there's three, four of them. They'll be circling around us, and then they're each waiting their turn to come and eat. He calls them by name so that they each have their turn. And whenever they have their turn, they just come where I'm kneeling, and they take a bite where his hand is. You see the hand that's touching the twig? Oh, uh, yeah? They take a bite. Yeah, they take a bite where his hand is there, and the next one comes along. <laughs> so I like that about Hara. It's very cool. And wow. I love Zanzibar. Thanks. I love Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's very vibrant. It's very... A lot of the places that I love, the thing they have in common is that they're very ancient. So Zanzibar is is... is it's quite dynamic. It has Bantu culture, but it, you know it was also the passing point for Indians. I say passing point, but in reality, I mean conquerors and people who came to enslave, steal, and loot. But nonetheless, they came from Persia, Oman, India, Portugal, um, the, the English, and all these people came in and left a little bit of their cultures that ultimately ended up creating the Swahili culture. Mm -hmm. So in Zanzibar, it sounds different. Swahili, The Swahili coast starts in northern Mozambique and goes all the way through Tanzania, Kenya, and some parts of um, Somalia. So, so it's quite rich and it's quite big. And I felt in... In, in Stone Town, I felt that I was at the center of, of it. I felt that I was at the heart of understanding the culture, the history, the heritage, but also being transported to a place that's like a fantasy. Zanzibar is incredibly beautiful, you know, like yeah. very beautiful. It's the kind of beauty after you, you, you know, when the first time you see Zanzibar in pictures, you can't get over it. You're thinking this place is beautiful. If you're a traveler, you want to go there. Then you book your flight to get to Zanzibar and you sit with your own eyes and you're thinking, wow. This is a hundred times better than the pictures. And then as you fly out of the island, you see it looking down. You look down and you're thinking, I cannot believe I was at this incredible place. I agree. What an experience. And then afterwards, when you get home, weeks, months, years later, it still flashes and it comes to you in flashes. You, you, you drink ginger and you remember the time you had that lovely coffee with a hint of ginger in Zanzibar and how even though there wasn't the first time we had ginger coffee, they made it just perfect. You know, you'll remember how you you saw the most beautiful water, how you felt the softest scent, you know, so it does that. It stays with you forever and it keeps playing itself in your memories over and over again. It's unforgettable. So that's what I love about Zanzibar. I think oh, that's it, right? Yeah, so you've got uh, Bamako in Mali, you've got Egypt, because you said Luxor, you said um, the Valley of the Pharaohs, you said Cairo, and then you had Hara in Ethiopia, Zanzibar in Tanzania, and then Maputo, is that your fifth one? I love Maputo, yes. I but love Maputo. Nairobi. What happened to Nairobi? It's a lot, there's a lot, um, but I think for today, I'll, I'll say Maputo, Maputo. just to to, to share with everyone that also another important, another way of experiencing the world and of experiencing destinations is looking what's immediately next to you, but that is so culturally different that you can get there cheaply, um, affordably, stay the longest because it takes less time to travel and be transported to a different dimension. So Maputo, for instance, it's very close to, to South Africa. It's about six hours in a bus, very cheap. But so we're just also, losing a little bit. Then, You're half showing on the picture. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah, thanks. But also Maputo is probably the most vibrant capital city I've been in in Southern Africa. Not very pulsating Latin life, cosmopolitan, Afropolitan. People are very free going, very free spirited. The food is delicious. My God, the food in, in Maputo and the food in Mozambique uh, is cooked with love, even if a person doesn't know you. Uh, even if a person is, is cooking to go sell food by the street side, 
the love is so, so tasteable in it. You can taste it so much that that it just draws you in. That is, it sounds crazy to say that, but like literally, if nothing else, go to Maputo because you want to know Mozambique. Go to Mozambique because you want to know what it tastes like to eat food that's cooked with love. Yeah. Um, and, affordable. and not necessarily because you are loved. Yeah, and affordable. So my dad actually worked at our high commission in Mozambique. So I was very fortunate to live in Maputo for a little bit. And he said, mm. correct, the, the fish is cheap. It's also, it's not just cheap, it's actually really good quality. So um, shellfish and everything. So we quite really mm. in Mozambique. So actually it brings me to rapid fire questions because I wanted to just ask you quick quick questions. Like <laughs> the best food that you ate, which, which city? Pardon? The best food on your trips? Zanzibar. Okay. And best party scene? Uganda, Kampala. Any particular club? Because I have friends from Uganda, so I will check. Uh, they must go to Ndinda. Ndinda is an area. They okay. must go to Ndinda. Okay. That's party central. Okay, so you went to both Senegal and Ghana. So which jollof rice is better? In Senegal, there's, they, they, there's the national dish is called chep jene. It's not called jollof. I think it's quite different. Oh. Not, it's not similar. Okay. You know, it's made with fish and they add vegetables in it. And it's also um, one pot dish. It's the most incredible it's the most incredible rice dish ever. It's, there's no, I don't know why other rice dishes try to act like there's a competition. There is none. Chep wins the race over and over and over again. Okay, well, there, there you go, Senegal. And where did you feel like your money stretched the, the most? Where you got value for money on your trips? Egypt. Egypt is quite affordable. Very, very, oh. very affordable. I was shocked, yes. I was quite shocked and pleasantly surprised, actually, by how much I could afford and how well I, I lived in my travels in Egypt. When I was in Daha, on some days, I had two massages a day just because it was the cheap. Wow. I was like, well, I mean, I could go drink water. Oh, I could go have a different massage. Wow. And that's, that's what happened. <laughs> okay. And then what about um, the safest city? Where did you feel comfortable Walking at night. Khartoum in Sudan. Really? It's so, so, so free. In fact, um, the hotel where I stayed, they used to, they used a ribbon to close the gate at night. So it was not for, for safety and security. It was to keep it from flapping in the wind, right? So they just tied it together with, with a ribbon. Oh my literally. God, really? <laughs> mm. That's a surprise for me. I was I was not expecting that. What about your craziest trip? I mean, you told me about a bus ride that you took to get from I think Abidjan to somewhere in Mali. Was that like the longest trip that you took? Yeah, that was the longest trip. I was going to to Timbuktu. Um, I left Abidjan at the very last minute. Uh, to go to Timbuktu, even though I needed to be in Timbuk Timbuktu at a specific date and a specific time. So I took a bus on Saturday morning in Abidjan. I traveled all of Saturday, all of Sunday, all of Monday, getting to Timbuktu, bus to Abidjan, from Abidjan to, to Bamako, Bamako to Mopti, Mopti to another place with a name that I completely forgot. Mm -hmm. And then from that place to Timbuktu. So that was quite that was quite a trip. I was oh I was so tired. I was hungry. I hadn't bathed in <laughs> it cost you how much did it cost you though? Um, it was quite cheap. Uh, it was it, it cost me like less than a hundred dollars. In total. Because mm. that's another thing. I mean, it, it brings me actually to um, my next question, which is just about how you funded your trips. So I think it'd be great for people to understand, you know, you were freelancing, but also just help us understand the perception that traveling in Africa is not affordable. So how do you I think traveling in Africa is affordable. And um, I think you do that by working with your budget. You know, you can't, you can't want to to always dine at a five star hotel unless you have serious money. You know you can't always want hot cuisine and hot experiences if definitely you're a person whose bank account keeps asking what the fuck. So um, <laughs> so for real though, 
right? So I, I, so what I did was, uh, even now when I travel, because I still want my my money in my travel fund to take me to the next destination. So what I do is I find. I love food, so I'll eat like street food, which I love, and then I'll find one or two good restaurants that are top rated, so that I can experience that. That I would, I, I love hot cuisine, and then um, I also negotiate a lot. I ask, I ask people to help me out. When I was in Kenya last year, I asked this guy who works at a, at Samburu, a national park. I said to him, you know what, I'm tired of having to pay non-african prizes in kenya there's three price points there's one for locals there's one for mm -hmm. east africans and there's one for everyone else mm -hmm. but the distance between kenya and everyone else is a bit too much because mind you i don't earn in dollars right so i think that's the problem with the african travel market is that it's very dollar yeah. euro centric versus also bearing in mind african travelers and um african currencies so so things like that um, can be tiring, but I really find that instead of being turned off by them because traveling by nature costs money, yeah. Um, I, I ask people to meet me halfway. Some of them say yes, some of them say no. Other ways I try. And I think also another thing is um, not associating travel with sponsored content. A lot of the times when we consume travel content, uh, especially before social media, mm -hmm. we people, we used to consume it from sponsored lifestyle shows. I'm a journalist and I know that when I've been invited by a hotel to stay over at their penthouse, even though I'm going to write about it, ultimately it's bullshit because my, my target market, they can afford to, but like, are you really taking like half of your salary to go sleep in a nice hotel room? No, right? So the perception that traveling around Africa is um, ex too expensive and out of out of reach for many people only comes from the from the reality that the continent doesn't market itself properly, and even tourism bots on the continent fail to market to Africans and fail to figure out how to to make the travel experience more accessible, come across as more accessible versus you always need to to get somewhere first, you know, you must, you must have money. Um, you must have money. Oh my gosh. I must have the wardrobe for it. Oh my gosh. I must look good. Like, you know, to each their own, but like someone once said to me before I started traveling, Oh my gosh, shouldn't you lose a little bit of weight? And I was like, what does that have to do with anything? But I think genuinely <laughs> there's a lot of things that people think need to happen before you can travel and i think the reality is you book a ticket you go you work with what you have if you want to go somewhere you don't have enough money stay at a backpacker stay at a hostel um stay at a shared airbnb or you can be hosted by a local look for locals who who who's, who host travelers on couchsurfing.com um go for couchsurfing.com across africa mm. okay I used it quite a bit. So this is when you go and you sleep in people's homes. Do you have, how much do you pay them? No, you don't pay. People, like, it's just a community of hosts and travelers. You you ask to stay over if they are able to host you. You come through, you stay. But how do you check that they're not um, part of a cult that takes harvest body parts? Like, I'm always freaking out about meeting strangers. <laughs> <laughs> I... Um, I mean, I think I look for people who stay with family versus I don't, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't care. Um, I never thought about it. Truth be told, I never thought about it. But um, I, I, I did also have a pattern of picking people. So I would look for people who stayed in, in places in Bujumbura, for instance, you know, versus I felt it felt more comfortable. Like if I if I couch surf in Addis Ababa, I can disappear into, into the city if I needed to or whatever, right? Yeah. Um and women, I would couch surf with women, although I've also couch surfed with men. I I just inherently trust that things will go well. And if things are not going to go well and someone tries to do something, unfortunately they're about to meet the biggest trouble of their life. I will attack you. I will F you up. I will kill you before you kill me. And I make no bones about it. Oh my God. You are the perfect person to do this because I'd be too scared and I would not sleep. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. So basically your tips are 
you know, work with your budget because you, like you say, most people think travel is expensive because all the ads you see <clears throat> are paid for by all these chains. And one thing you said to me that I thought was really interesting when you told me about this, the trip from Abidjan to Timbuktu, and I said to you, but how did you know what bus to get on? Because in Africa, we're notorious for not sharing information. So you can go online, like I can go online if I'm trying to take a bus, like I took the bus once from New York to Minnesota like 13 years ago, and it tells me the schedule, I know where to go. And you said yeah. you need to ask people. So how does that work? Yeah, so I, I went to the bus station. So um, I, I, I told everyone that I wanted to go to Timbuktu and, and Someone said, well, it's in the northern region, so go to this particular place because that's where you get transport that goes to that region where you want to go. And then, so what I did was at any, all points of the journey, I would communicate my final destination. So one person knew in Bamako it, the specific transport hub I needed to go to. That's all they knew. Once I got there, then I needed to find a specific bus to Timbuktu. Then there was the next part of the trip taken care of. And then it turns out that the other direct buses, I needed to change transport in Mopti. And because I didn't know how far from Mopti we were, I just kept on saying to the driver every time we stopped for food and refreshments, don't forget about me when we get to Mopti. Don't forget about me when we get in to Mopti. In French or in English? In, in English. Okay. In English. Um, and then when we got to Mopti, he physically like took me and deposited me in a taxi and said to that guy, she's going to Timbuktu, so make sure you leave her oh, wow. at that point where she needs to go. And um, then these two guys who were also in the taxi said, oh, we're also going to Timbuktu, so we'll travel together. So even though it's, it's not that we Africans don't share information, um, you need resources to share information, to run blogs, to run websites, and all those things, right? Um, so... Uh, but organizations are lazy because this is information that organizations should actually have, <laughs> companies should have. But, but where all these things lag, um, you have your mouth, ask people. People live there, people know their hometowns, people know their land, you know, people are not going to, you are lost, but people are definitely not lost in their land. Even if they might not know exactly where you're going, they, they'll, have, they'll help you figure, they will help you figure it out. Oh, that's really good. And you funded your trip by doing freelance work. Just tell us how you were doing that. I know you volunteered as well in some places. So just walk us through how you were paying for this five-year journey. I was working as a freelance journalist, writing for newspapers, mostly in South Africa, and I would get paid. And that's how I funded my travels. I used some of my savings. And then um, in... In Malawi, in Malawi, I, I, I stayed in Nkatab. I went to visit a place called Nkata Bay. Mm -hmm. And there was there's a nice hotel there called Butterfly House. So at Butterfly House, if you if you help, if you volunteer for the community project, get a discount on your room, on your rate. So I, I volunteered. That was great. And then um, in another place in, in Uganda, in Jinja, mm -hmm. I, I asked for a discount. And, you know, I, I think I think generally speaking, people are easygoing. And I think people are more helpful than not helpful. And sometimes, even if it's a little bit crazy to have someone show up at your doorstep when you run an adventure company and say, listen, I want to do this. It costs $150. Even though I have it, I'm freelancing and I'm really anxious about running out of money. So can I like not pay $150? And they say, okay, yeah, sure, you can pay $80. Wow. You know, I think, right? So I think people are generally generally nice they're generally kind they're generally understanding. In some cases, I've had um people who work in in um in experiences like when i went working with lions in zimbabwe uh, in the big falls they, they the official rule is that you can't take your your own pictures mm -hmm. so you can't use your cell phone or your camera and you must buy your pictures from the experience i think they are like a hundred dollars and i was like my god another hundred dollar experience i'm sick of this mess i'm tired of paying and the the, the guards who were working with us he said to me okay sissy just give me your phone and he took videos wow. he took, you know and i think i really think because I'm very vocal about, I travel a lot. 
um, I can afford to, but that's because I make the time to afford to, right? I save, I move things. I'm always doing a bit of financial gymnastics, you know? <laughs> What can I let go of so that I can travel? Uh, if I if I'm about to spend two three thousand rands now on something at the shop, can I make it a thousand five hundred and take the rest of the money to my travel fund? Right. So I'm always negotiating those spaces so that I'm able to travel. I think that's really good advice to people because I think they don't. It, it takes conscious planning, and that's what you're doing. And you said that you've made travel part of your lifestyle. So even when you're but every month you've got, I'm going to save this to travel and plan ahead. I think that's really yeah, great. It's, it's, it, it's so important. It's, it's a line item. Like there has to be a travel fund as you go. There's some jobs that I do um, as a freelance journalist. Like um, I just wrote a story now for Destiny Magazine about the impact of of COVID-19 on the travel industry in Africa, the money that I'm getting from it, I'm just gonna put in my travel fund because I already have a salary. I don't need it to to survive in my day to day, right? What? So instead of getting instead of getting a gorgeous bottle of perfume, and trust me, I want a gorgeous bottle of perfume, I'm just gonna take it to my travel fund instead wow. because believe you me, the moment we can travel again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, what I'll do is before we get into your book, I want to just show some of the comments. So uh, Ranveer, who I know who lives here in Singapore and is a friend of mine. Hi, Ranveer. Thank you so much for watching. He's corrected me and said it's Ghana versus Nigeria for Jalof. So I will not make that mistake. Please, Ghanaians and Nigerians, forgive me. But I will ask this question of someone in time. Um, my mom is on the show as well. And she's just saying she's really enjoying the um, listening to live presentation. So thanks, mom, for watching. Um, and we've got more comments from Sayapi, who is in Houston. So I hope you guys actually are taking this feedback and plan to um, travel through Africa. Um, so just I was asking about you, obviously you've written this book. Um, and what you wanted to get a sense from you was to capture and summarize your five years of travel. But not mm. everyone writes so What inspired you and why should people buy your book? <laughs> Excuse me. I think um, I should definitely buy my book to to find out what happens if you give yourself a shot to try that one thing that seems so wild, you know. I'm just going to quit my life and travel. I'm going to quit this job and start a passion project. You know, whatever your dream is. Mine is just travel, traveling Africa in particular. But whatever that thing is that you love, right? And that doesn't necessarily take away anything from your life if you don't do it, if I never traveled Africa, my life would still be beautiful. My life would still be gorgeous. I would still travel anyway, because I love traveling. But because I took a chance in that particular moment when I thought, when, why go for a holiday when I can make this my life for like three months or oh, hang on a year? Oh shit, five years, <laughs> you know? Uh, give yourself that chance. What happens when you do that? But in particular, what does happen when you travel this continent? When you show up and you leave all expectations at home, you humble yourself, you are, you, you, you are humble, you understand that you are not here to to judge and poke and and turn every single experience into a sociological encounter. I get so frustrated by, in particular, South Africans who who travel the continent and and write about it either in the news or or write you know um speak about it on whatever platform. And they go, I really loved this particular place, but my God, it was so poor. And I think to myself, you live in the most unequal place in the world. Da, you know. You live with your poverty. So so everything that we tend to really put under a microscope when we are examining Africa is things that are already in our back door anyway. So don't ruin your experience by carrying that baggage. Don't ruin your experience by wanting to travel Africa to come to so that you can say it is so true that it's poor. It is so true that it's such a difficult continent to, to travel. It is so, so true that you'll have problems at the border post. You have problems at the border post anyway. My worst border experience was at Heathrow Airport in London. I really, I was just like starting to overheat, right? I was starting to literally overheat. Um, so, so just show up and tell yourself, I'm going to have the most beautiful time of my life. And how you have that beautiful time is to put people at the center of your experiences when you travel in this continent. Because despite the incredible natural beauty, and it is incredible.
incredible despite the amazing food and my god it's delicious despite the music despite the personalities despite all else that you will meet around the continent and that will be sensational it is the people and you giving yourself time to be hosted by people that will ultimately turn a few days away into a moment in time you know if someone offers you tea drink it people here are very hospitable you know someone says come home i want you to meet my family if you're not going somewhere in a hurry and no one is ever in a hurry when they're on, on a holiday or traveling right it's not that much of a hurry show up because when you experience people and you experience being you experience our hospitality then you truly 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 have experienced the most beautiful thing that africa has to offer the heart of us of our us as africans our generosity our kindness our spirit our our art our creativity um everything wow i love that that's just that you've just basically sold the book to everybody because that's a really good summary so i know we're coming up and it's on amazon <laughs> yeah you go to amazon or oh, is it available in bookstores in joe in south africa in south africa definitely everywhere in south africa you can find vagabond you can also find it at prestige books in nairobi you can find it through civilo books in Khaboroni and exclusive books in Khaboroni, and you can find it at Wida Books in Lagos. Oh, great. And it's also on Amazon. So I'm, it was supposed to be delivered yes. to me today, but I'm still waiting because of COVID. So, but you I know I, the world has shut down. Sorry. I know. Hey, so my last question for you was, so when we were talking, I said to you that I would love to see your, your, your uh, book turn into a movie. So my last question is, who would play you in the movie? Gabri Sidibe. Oh! I, I thought so long and hard and I struggled. I was like, hoo -hoo. but I, I love Gobri. I think she's vivacious. She's fun. And you know what? I'm a big girl and I want a big girl to play me. She's funny. She's intense. Um, and I think when you see her in action in her roles, if it, she needs to be frivolous, she'll be, you know, she, she's, she's, she's layered. She can, she's that girl. She delivers. I love her. And I would definitely love to be played by her. Okay, well, I'm publicly placing dibs on your book. So Hollywood, please call me. I'll arrange to get this script written. Um, I think you and I will need to touch base <laughs> afterwards, but I would really like, we need more Africa content. We need more stories told. You know, Michelle Obama always says that tell your story because your story mm. matters. And I think you've done an mm. amazing job of that. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, thank you so much. So fun. I, I think I, I've laughed so much. <laughs> I kept on covering my mouth because I just, it was so funny. We could talk and talk and talk, but I'm sure we'll have you on the show again. But I just wanted to say- Absolutely. Um, I just want to thank you for, for this platform, for this conversation. It's It's been fabulous. It just felt like we're just meeting for coffee down I'm... the road. And I just want to thank everyone who joined us for this conversation, for your participation um, and interaction. And what I love most about these platforms and talking is that then I get to experience other people's travels, travels as well, like Benson, um, you know, Duncan. So I love that you get to experience community of travel. Yeah, no, it's great. I couldn't have put it any better. So thank you, Lorato. And thank you, everyone, for watching the show. It's been really good fun. And we'll see you next week for another episode of Diaspora Chronicles. Thanks and bye. Bye. Thank you so much.